Hey guys, Sam from Amphis Makes. How are you all? Welcome back to all my returners and hi to any newbies. This is, of course, the segment on the weekend where I read you stories and it is Sunday's stories. So if you are new here, I read you stories from this book here, which is Grimm's Complete Fairy Tales. Little disclaimer, these were written so, so, so long ago and things have changed since then. I am literally just reading you the words from the pages. I am not saying that I share these viewpoints or beliefs. I am literally just reading you how the author wrote. Uh, there is a complete playlist on my channel and I have also read The Wizard of Oz, which is on a playlist on my channel also. And the reasoning behind this is that a Saturday and a Sunday has a bit more of a chilled vibe and you don't have to keep looking at the screen. All you have to do is listen while you craft. OK, so yesterday's stories weren't that long and I don't think today's will be that long either. But let's get started. And we are starting on story 142, which is called Simile Mountain. Um, there was once two brothers, the one rich, the other poor. The rich one, however, gave nothing to the poor one, and he gained a scanty living by trading in corn, and often did so badly that he had no bread for his wife and children. Once, when he was wheeling a barrow through the forest, he saw, on one side of him, a great, bare, naked-looking mountain, and as he had never seen it before, he stood still and stared at it with amazement. While he was thus standing, he saw twelve great wild men climbing towards him, and as he believed they were robbers, he pushed his barrow into the thicket, climbed up a tree, and waited to see what would happen. The twelve men, however, went to the mountain and cried, Semsi Mountain! Semsi Mountain! Open! And immediately the barren mountain opened down the middle, and the twelve went into it, and as soon as they were within, it shut. After a short time, however, it opened again, and the, main, and the men came forth carrying heavy sacks on their shoulders, and when they were all once more in the daylight, they said, Semsi Mountain, Semsi Mountain, shut yourself. Then the mountain closed together, and there was no longer any entrance to be seen to it, and the twelve went away. When they were well out of sight, the poor man got down from the tree, and was curious to know what really was secretly hidden in the mountain. So he went up to it and said, Semsi Mountain, Semsi Mountain, open, and the mountain opened to him also. Then he went inside, and the whole mountain was a cavern full of silver and gold, and behind lay great piles of pearls and sparkling jewels heaped up like corn. The poor man hardly knew what to do, and whether he might take any of these treasures for himself or not, but at last he filled his pockets with gold, but he left the pearls and precious stones where they were. When he came out again, he also said, Semsi Mountain, Semsi Mountain, shut yourself. And the mountain closed itself, and he went home with his barrow. And now he had no more cause for anxiety, but could buy bread for his wife and children with his gold and wine into the bargain. He lived joyously and uprightly, gave help to the poor, and did good to everyone. When, however, the money came to an end, he went to his brother, borrowed a measure that held a bushel, and brought himself some more, but did not touch any of the most valuable things. When, for the third time, he wanted to fetch something, he again borrowed the measure of his brother. The rich man had, however, long been envious of his brother's possessions, and of the handsome way of living which he had set on foot, and could not understand from whence the riches came, and what his brother wanted with the measure. Then he thought of a cunning trick, and covered the bottom of the measure with pitch, and when he had got the measure back, a piece of money was sticking to it. He at once went to his brother and asked him, What have you been measuring in the bushel measure? Corn and barley, said the other. Then he showed him the piece of money and threatened that if he did not tell the truth, he would accuse before a court of justice. The, man, the poor man then told him everything, just as it happened. The rich man, however, ordered his carriage to be made ready and drove away, resolved to use the opportunity better than his brother had done, and to bring back with him quite different treasures. When he came to the mountain, he cried, Semsi Mountain, Semsi Mountain, open up. The mountain opened and he went inside it. There lay the treasures all before him, and for a long time he did not know which to clutch at first. At length he loaded himself with as many precious stones as he could carry. He wished to carry his load outside, but as his heart and soul were entirely full of the treasures, he had forgotten the name of the mountain, and cried, Simile Mountain, Simile Mountain, open. Then that, however, was not the right name, and the mountain never stirred, but remained shut. 
Then he was alarmed, but the longer he thought about it, the more his thoughts confused themselves and his treasures were no more of any use to him. In the evening, the mountain opened and the twelve robbers came in, and when they saw him, they laughed and cried out, Bird, have we caught you at last? Did you think we had never noticed that you had been in here twice? We could not catch you then. This third time you shall not get out again. Then he cried, It was not I, it was my brother. But let him beg for his life and say what he would. They cut his head off. Okay, and the next story is story 143, and it's called Going a Travelling. There was once a poor woman who had a son who much wished to travel, but his mother said, How can you travel? We have no money at all for you to take away with you. Then said the son, I will manage very well for myself. I will always say, Not much, not much, not much. So he walked for a long time and always said, Not much, not much, not much. Then he passed by a company of fishermen and said, God speed you, not much, not much, not much. What say you, peasant, not much? And when the net was drawn out, they had, ca they had not caught much fish. So one of them fell on the youth with a stick and said, Have you never seen me thrashing? What should I say then, asked the youth? You must say, get it full, get it full. After this, he again walked a long time and said, get it full, get it full, until he came to the gallows where they had a poor sinner whom they were about to hang. Then said he, good morning, get it full, get it full. What say you, knave, get it full? Do you want to make out that there are still more wicked people in the world? Is not this enough? And he again got some blows on his back. What am I to say then, said he? You must say, may God have pity on the poor soul. Again the youth walked on for a long while and said, May God have pity on the poor soul. Then he came to a pit by which stood a knacker who was cutting up a horse. The youth said, Good morning, God have pity on the poor soul. What do you say, you ill-tempered knave, said the knacker. Uh, and the knacker gave him such a box on the ear that he could not see out of his eyes. What am I to say then? You must say, There lies the carrion in the pit. So he walked on and always said, There lies the carrion in the pit, there lies the carrion in the pit. And he came to a cart full of people, so he said, Good morning, there lies the carrion in the pit. Then the cart pushed him into a hole, and the driver took his whip and crack, cracked it upon the youth, till he was forced to crawl back to his mother, and as long as he lived, he never went out travelling again. The next story is story 144 and it is called The Donkey. Once upon a time there lived a king and a queen who were rich and had everything they wanted but no children. The queen lamented over this day and night and said, I am like a field on which nothing grows. At last God gave her her wish, but when the child came into the world it did not look like a human child but was a little donkey. When the mother saw that her sorrow and outcries grew. She said she would far rather have no child at all than have a donkey, and that they were to throw it into the water that the fishes might devour it. But the king said, No, since God has sent him, he shall be my son and heir, and after my death sit on the royal throne and wear the kingly crown. The donkey, therefore, was brought up and grew bigger, and his ears grew up beautifully high and straight. He was, however, of a merry disposition, jumped about, played, and had especial pleasure in music so that he went to a celebrated musician and said, Teach me your art, that I may play the lute as well as you do. Ah, dear little master, answered the musician, that would come very hard to you. Your fingers are certainly not suited to it and are far too big. I am afraid the strings would not last. No excuses were of any use. The donkey was determined to play the lute. He was persevering and industrious, and at last learned to do it as well as the master himself. The young lordling once went out walking, full of thought, and came to a well. He looked into it, and in the mirror clear water saw his donkey's form. He was so distressed about it that he went out into the wide world and only took with him one faithful companion. They travelled up and down, and at last they came into a kingdom where an old king reigned who had only but one, who had an only but wonderfully beautiful daughter. The donkey said, "Here we will stay." Knocked at the gate and cried. A guest is without open that he may enter. As, however, the gate was not opened, he sat down, took his lute and played it in the most delightful manner with his two four feet. Then the doorkeeper opened his eyes most wonderfully wide and ran to the king and said, 
Outside by the gate sits the young donkey which plays the lute as well as any experienced master. Then let the musician come to me, said the king. When, however, a donkey came in, everyone began to laugh at the lute player, and now the donkey was asked to sit down and eat with the servants. He, however, was unwilling and said, I am no common stable ass, I am a noble one. Then they said, If that is what you are, seat yourself with the men of war. No, said he, I will sit by the king. The king smiled and said good-humouredly, Yes, it shall be as you say. Little ass, come here to me. Then he asked, Little ass, how does my daughter please you? The donkey turned his head towards her, looked at her, nodded and said, I like her above measure. I have never yet seen anyone so beautiful as she is. Well then, you shall sit next to her too, said the king. That is exactly what I wish, said the donkey, and he placed himself by her side, ate and drank and knew how to behave himself daintily and cleanly. When the noble beast had stayed a long time at the king's court, he thought, What good does all this do to me? I shall still have to go home again. Let his head hang sadly and went to the king and asked for his dismissal. But the king had grown fond of him and said, Little ass, what ails you? You look as sour as a jug of vinegar. I will give you what you want. Do you want gold? No, said the donkey and shook his head. Do you want jewels and expensive clothes? No. Do you wish for half my kingdom? Indeed, no. Then, said the king, if only I knew what would make you happy. Will you have my pretty daughter to wife? Ah, yes, said the ass. I should indeed like her. And all at once he became quite merry and full of happiness, for that was exactly what he was wishing for. So a great and splendid wedding was held. In the evening, when the bride and bridegroom were led into their bedroom, the king wanted to know if the ass would behave well, and ordered a servant to hide himself there. When they were both inside, the bridegroom bolted the door, looked around, and as he believed that they were quite alone, he suddenly threw off his ass's skin and stood there in the form of a handsome royal youth. Now, said he, you see who I am, and see also that I am not unworthy of you. Then the bride was glad and kissed him and loved him dearly. When morning came, he jumped up, put his animal's skin on again, and no one could have guessed what kind of a form was hidden beneath it. Soon came the old king. Ah, cried he, is the little ass merry? But surely you are sad, said he to his daughter, that you have not got a proper man for your husband. Oh no, dear father, I love him as well as if he were the handsomest in the world, and I will keep him as long as I live. The king was surprised, but the servant who had concealed himself came and revealed everything to him. The king said, that cannot be true. Then watch yourself the next night, and you will see it with your own eyes. And listen, Lord King, if you were to take his skin away and throw it in the fire, he would be forced to show himself in his true shape. Your advice is good, said the king, and at night when they were asleep he stole in, and when he got to the bed he saw by the light of the moon a noble-looking youth lying there, and the skin lay stretched on the ground. So he took it away and had a great fire lighted outside, and threw the skin into it, and remained by it himself until it was all burned to ashes. As, however, he was anxious to know how the robbed man would behave himself, he stayed awake the whole night and watched. When the youth had slept his sleep out, he got up by the first light of morning and wanted to put on the ass's skin, but it was not to be found. On this he was alarmed and full of grief and anxiety, said, Now I shall have to contrive to escape. But when he went out, there stood the king, who said, My son, where away in such haste? What have you in mind? Stay here, you are such a handsome man, you shall not go away from me. I will now give you half my kingdom, and after my death you shall have the whole of it. Then I hope that what begins so well may end well, and I will stay with you, said the youth. And the old man gave him half the kingdom, and in a year's time when he died the youth had the whole, and after the death of his father he had another kingdom as well, and lived in all magnificence. Okay, guys, and the last story for today is story 145, and it is The Ungrateful Son. A man and his wife were once sitting by the door of their house, and they had a roasted chicken set before them, and were about to eat it together. Then the man saw that his aged father was coming, and hastily took the chicken and hid it, for he would not permit him to have any of it. The old man came, took a drink, and went away. Now the son wanted to put the roasted chicken on the table again, but when he took it up it had become a great toad which jumped into his face and sat there and never went away again. 
and if anyone wanted to take it off, it looked venomously at him, as if it would jump in his face, so that no one would venture to touch it. And the ungrateful son was forced to feed the toad every day, or else it fed on his face, and thus he went about the world without knowing peace. Another odd one to end this Sunday stories. Okay, guys, so like I said, that is it for today. I hope the rest of your Sunday is a wonderful one, and I hope the week ahead will be equally as marvellous. I will, of course, see you throughout the week in various videos, and I would just like to say thank you so much for spending your weekend with me. I really enjoy you enjoy having you here, and I appreciate that you spent some of your precious time. Okay, guys, so until I see you again, stay safe, be kind, look after one another, get some good quality time in with your loved ones, and get some good quality crafting time. I will see you in the next one, or around the YouTube street. And as usual, I have notifications blocking the stop button. See you later, guys. Love ya!